Sankal welcomes you all for the webinar today. We're delighted to have you join us as we take a significant step towards enhancing healthcare for all. We thank our speaker, Dr. Dr. Umesh Jalihal, sir, for joining us today who will share some interesting updates around PPIs. Before we begin, a quick intro on Sankalp. The Sankalp initiative driven by Sun Pharma is a pledge to provide healthcare practitioners with the latest and credible scientific information to empower them to be the first and be the best in dealing lifestyle-related diseases, particularly in diabetes, hypertension, asthma, and acid peptic disorders. Our webinar today revolves around a topic that we believe will be of immense significance in your daily practice. So without further ado, we welcome you to this informative session and we can't wait to dive into the discussion. This is our agenda today. Now without much delay, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our keynote speaker for today, none other than Dr. Umesh Jalihar sir. Sir has done MBBS, MD General Medicine, DM Gastroenterology, DNB Gastroenterology, he is also director of Karnataka Gastro Center, Bangalore. He is a former professor and head of gastroenterology department at the reputed MS Ramaya Memorial Hospital, Bangalore. And today's lecture is on the topic, Proton Pump Inhibitors in the Management of Gastroesophageal Reflux Disease, Current Advancements. So without any further delay, sir, I would like to hand over this session to you, sir, for your talk. Kindly proceed over to you, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, I think uh, welcome back. Uh, Some time back, uh, we had a uh, uh, lot of uh, uh, you know discussions, uh, semi topics uh, ranging uh, from G reflux disease, irritable bowel syndrome, and so on. I think at the outset, I must uh, thank Sankalp and Clarinet for organizing this important uh, uh, webinar on G reflux disease. Uh, as we uh, know, G reflux disease is a very common problem. In the community, I think uh, roughly about uh, uh, 15 to 20 percent uh, in some countries, up to 25 percent population suffers from G reflux disease. So it's uh, imperative that we know about uh, G, G reflux disease so that uh, we should be able to uh, help our patients in day-to-day uh, -day practice. So today we talk about uh, the advancement uh, in the management of gastroesophageal reflux disease. And uh, the proton pump inhibitors uh, is the mainstay of the treatment of a G reflux disease. Hence, uh, there is a need to know more about uh, proton pump inhibitors. So, before we start uh, the discussion on uh, proton pump inhibitors, let's understand uh, a little bit about uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, like uh, what is its prevalence, how is it? Uh, the cost and uh, how a patient of G reflux patient presents in our clinics. <clears throat> As you all know, G reflux disease is a gastrointestinal disorder characterized by regurgitation of the gastric contents into the esophagus. Based on endoscopic and histopathological appearance, GRD is classified basically into two categories that is, endoscopy negative reflux disease or erosive esophagitis. That means when we find, uh, you know, normal mucosa, patient has reflux symptoms. Uh, it's called negative uh, NERD or uh, non-erosive reflux disease. When patient has uh, reflux symptoms and we do an endoscopy, uh, we find, suppose, uh, the erosions in the esophagus, then it's called eros erosive esophagitis. Sometimes long-standing G reflux disease uh, uh, if tre untreated in small percentage of patients can progress to chronic uh, uh, mucosal damage, uh, what is caused as uh, Barrett's esophagus. What will happen is there is a metaplastic uh, squam uh, columnar epithelial change uh, at the lower end of the squamous, uh, 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 squamous epithelium at the squamous columnar junction part of the uh, esophagus. That's called Barrett's esophagus. It's a potentially pre-malignant condition. If it is untreated, patient can have dysplasia, adenocarcinoma, and so on. So this is the schematic diagram, which shows the esophagus. Uh, and uh, there's a G junction here, close, uh, uh, which uh, show, uh, shows the closed esophageal sphincter. And you'll see that in the stomach, the 
uh, bluish green liquid present in the stomach is uh, confined only to the stomach in the first uh, pick. In the second comparative picture, you will see that uh, the liquid in the stomach, which is uh, shown uh, in the bluish green uh, area, that is nothing but uh, the stomach acid, uh, because of the laxity of the lower esophageal sphincter can uh, reflex back into the esophagus. That's when you get uh, reflex symptoms. So, if you look at the symptoms of G reflux disease, they can be typically uh, typical symptoms or uh, atypical symptoms, or the symptoms can be confined to the esophagus uh, or in the gastroesophageal uh, area, or they could uh, uh, be beyond the esophagus, what we call it as uh, extra esophageal symptoms. Uh, in small percentage of patients, uh, when there is a chronic reflux present, they can, uh, uh, you know, get uh, uh, complicated. They can present with uh, certain complications. Then we call it as alarming symptoms. So the typical symptoms in a given patient uh, of G reflux disease are uh, basically heartburn, acid regurgitation, global sensation, mild epigastric pain, dyspepsia, or the vague abdominal upper abdominal discomfort, or there can be nausea and or vomiting. The exercise visual symptoms that is beyond the, the esophagus, which will present to uh, our uh, pulmonology colleagues or ENT colleagues or sometimes uh, the cardiology department, they can present with uh, wheezing, laryngitis, hacking cough, hoarseness of voice, throat clearing, global sensation, sore throat, chronic bronchitis and sleep apnea. Uh, the alarming symptoms uh, they can present with, especially in elderly individuals, uh, extra esophageal, sorry, the uh, dysphagia, especially when patient uh, of uh, reflux uh, with the long-standing uh, symptoms can present with uh, a stricture in the esophagus, uh, so-called peptic stricture or malignancy. They can have dysphagia, the atypical chest pain. They can have shortness of breath. They can have sensation of lump in the throat and so on. So these are some of the things uh, we need to know about. They can uh, also very rarely present with uh, GI bleed, especially when there is a uh, bleeding from the peptic stricture or malignancy. As I said in the beginning of my talk, the prevalence of uh, G reflux disease is pretty common. If you look at the global data, it uh, uh, is around 13.98%, uh, whereas uh, if you look at the meta-analysis, uh, the in India, uh, the prevalence is something like 15.6%. So what are the contributing factors for the G reflux disease? Uh, in the contributing factors, there are esophageal factors, anti-reflux uh, barrier-related uh, problems, and uh, gastroduodenal uh, factors, phenotypic presentations, and uh, complications. The esophageal factors, uh, are basically reduced uh, uh, or altered peristalsis. Whenever there is a decrease in the esophageal motility or the gastroduodenal motility, the esophageal clearance is decreased. That means uh, if the stomach contents, uh, which will reflex back into the esophagus, will not be cleared. So the exposure, acid exposure time will be increased, and hence they get symptoms of reflux. There will be decrease in the salivary secretions and the esophageal contents clearance will be delayed. That's when they, there will be prolonged stay of acid into the esophagus and can cause mucosal damage and inflammation of the mucosa. So that will lead to dilated intraepithelial sp uh, spaces and hypersensitivity. The Coming to the anti-reflux barrier disruption plays an important role. In this, we have uh, transient uh, lower esophageal uh, relaxations and uh, it is uh, swallow-related uh, relaxation which occurs uh, in uh, G-reflux patients. There will be basically hyposensitive lower esophageal sphincter, stress reflux associated with the hiatus hernia. Regarding the complications, uh, the ulceration, stricture, adenocarcinoma, and the extra esophageal manifestations are the predominant uh, presentations of uh, long standing reflux.
still with the pathogenesis of uh, uh, G reflux disease in adults. How it uh, starts in a given patient? Uh, typically, most of these patients uh, present in the middle age, that is the 30 or 40 years, the third or fourth decade. And most of these patients are obese. Whenever there's obesity, there's a linear correlation of uh, obesity with the G reflux disease. Uh, that means higher the weight gain uh, patient has, there is higher the chances of reflux. Similarly, in certain other uh, uh, physiological conditions like pregnancy and trauma, patients are predisposed for G reflux disease. And uh, something to do with a normal esophagogastric junction also is responsible for reflux, laxity of the lower sphincter, presence of hiatus hernia, uh, and so on. And uh, the associated uh, neuromuscular disorders, for example, scleroderma, connective tissue disorders, where there is laxity of the lower esophageal sphincter, they all predispose to G reflux. Uh, commonly, even physiologically, we can get reflux, wherein the stomach contents come into the esophagus, uh, and uh, we all experience this physiological reflux. But uh, if it uh, becomes a uh, very frequent phenomenon, uh, and then uh, a patient has uh, a lot of these symptoms like burning sensation or heartburn or uh, warm sensation and reflux of the gastric contents into the esophagus, large volume things. Then it becomes a pathological reflux. So that's when we need to uh, treat these uh, patients. That point of time, they end up having mucosal disease like esophagitis, strictures, metaplasia and cancer and so on. So, how do we treat this uh, reflux patients? Uh, the commonly G reflux disease is treated with lifestyle modifications in uh, most of these patients, as uh, uh, you know, in our clinics. Uh, in this lifestyle modifications, uh, we tell our patients to uh, sleep with uh, a head end raised. They can use a six inch wooden block and keep the head end of the cot raised uh, so that. Uh, when they sleep for eight hours during the night time, the stomach contents do not come and there is no pooling of the, uh, the stomach contents, acidic contents into the esophagus that can be avoided. And uh, we also tell them to at least keep a gap of three hours between the meal and going to bed so that uh, the reflux uh, that is uh, occurs because of the mechanical problem can be avoided. Next is uh, they should be told to lose weight, weight loss. As I said, uh, obesity is the predominant uh, uh, or one of the important risk factors for GE reflux disease. So weight loss helps in uh, the treatment of these symptoms. Avoid, you know, tightening, uh, tight garments. Uh, they should uh, uh, wear loose fittings uh, so that uh, they do not get increase in the intra-abdominal pressure. Coming to the drugs, uh, starting from uh, many decades, uh, our uh, predecessors, and, uh, predecessors and professors have been treating them with antacids and H2 receptor antagonists. In the last two, three decades, uh, we have come a long way with uh, better drugs in the form of uh, proton pump inhibitors, which will uh, block the final common pathway of acid secretion and bring in the better acid uh, uh, tight acid uh, uh, control. So uh, the proton pump inhibitors uh, will help in the final common pathway blockage. So that's how the uh, treatment of uh, G reflux disease is very, very uh, uh, effective with uh, PPIs. In small percentage of patients, uh, maybe I think 1 to 2% of patients end up undergoing uh, the surgical procedures uh, which is used for valve tightening between the esophagus and the stomach. There is a G junction which is defective. That needs to be corrected by either endoscopic uh, procedures or by the laparoscopic procedures. So what is called as fundoplication. That means uh, an effective functioning G uh, 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 junction. That is a flap valve which prevents the reflux of gastric contents into the esophagus is done by either the uh, endoscopist or the surgeons. There are many uh, 
you know advanced endoscopic procedures which are also used to uh, refashion this uh, defective g junction and this uh, we have transoral incision less fundoplication and strata procedure which will induce fibrosis at the g junction and uh, which is used to counter the g reflex uh, problem so if you look at the management algorithm classically of this g reflex disease suppose patient uh, has got a heartburn or sore regurgitation without any alarming symptoms what we do is we uh, suggest the patient's uh, lifestyle modifications initially if the symptoms are mild or occasional then you give them h2 receptor antagonists or antacids then look at the response and follow up the uh, these patients if on the long term management the symptoms are better you just kind try to maintain that way or if the symptoms are less you can uh, switch over to on demand treatment or reduce the dose or stop the medications and reassess these patients after some time and if they have recurrence of symptoms treat them with the same sort of drugs that is h2 receptor antagonists or antacids this is usually uh, the scenario when it's a mild uh, g reflux disease which uh, is amenable for uh, some, uh, you know uh, less efficacious drugs suppose patient have got uh, severe or frequent symptoms then we will have to introduce proton pump inhibitors uh, mostly once a day dosage suppose there is no response uh, we need to optimize the uh, dose of the proton pump inhibitors especially if there is a severe reflux disease instead of 40 mg of pentaprazole we have to give them 80 mg of pentaprazole that's what is called by, or meant by dose optimization if there is a response we should go ahead and uh, treat them for uh, about 8 to 12 weeks suppose there is no relief with uh, even dose optimization then we need to perform an upper gi endoscopy to fi find out whether we are missing something to confirm the diagnosis of g reflux disease we have to perform an endoscopy find out whether patient has got esophagitis or whether patient has got some motility problem in which case the endoscopy shows normal um, esophageal mucosa or patient has got any alternative uh, diagnosis like eosinophilic esophagitis and so on and generally the ppi therapy is given for about 8 weeks if there is no response then we have to perform uh, the extended uh, gi uh, grd workup with the help of uh, 24 hours uh, ph metry and manometry to rule out the motility problems like uh, the diffuse esophageal spasm achalasia cardia nutcracker esophagus and so on if uh, suppose uh, there is unconfirmed reflux symptoms association uh, we have to treat them as uh, something like a functional dyspepsia probably they are benefited by using drugs like uh, tricyclic antidepressants or serotonin uh, receptor uptake inhibitors ssris like uh, escitalopram and so on so if you look at uh, the consensus treatment algorithm for the management of grd with ppis it goes like this the you need to confirm the diagnosis of g reflux disease rule out gastroparesis consider nature severity and frequency of symptoms if there are recurrent episodes uh, like more than 3 episodes per week we need to give them otc over the counter proton pump inhibitors for roughly about 14 days plus you need to refer if there is no uh, response then we have to think of optimum ppi beyond 14 days so that's uh, the usual uh, uh, treatment algorithm for reflux disease a uh, word or two about uh, uh, the proton pump inhibitors uh, pharmacokinetic properties uh, traditionally we've been using uh, the omeprazole esomeprazole lansoprazole abiprazole and uh, pentaprazole uh, in the last 2 uh, to 3 decades if you look at uh, the bioavailability of the omeprazole it is very less uh, something like uh, 30 to 40% uh, 
and uh, we have come a long way from there with uh, 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 a rise in the bioavailability of uh, lansoprazole as high as 80 to 85 percent whereas others are somewhere in the 50 to 60 percent range the maximum plasma concentration is around uh, one to two hours and plasma half-life is again one to two hours. Sometimes it will be a little less than one hour in some patients. Metabolism uh, occurs most probably in uh, the uh, liver uh, through cytochrome P450 uh, hepatic enzyme uh, pathway. But there are certain uh, drugs like rabiprazole and pantoprazole which will use non-enzymatic pathway. That's how they are uh, preferred, uh, especially the pentaprazole and rabiprazole. Whenever there is a drug-drug interactions uh, suspected, especially when patient has got multiple comorbidities like ischemic heart disease, uh, bronchial asthma, and so on. So the dose of the uh, proton pump inhibitors are like uh, uh, esomeprazole is 40 mg, rabiprazole is 20 mg, ilaprazole 10 mg, dexlansoprazole 30 mg, and uh, these are the commonly used drugs. Indian Society of uh, Gastroenterologists recommends the use of proton pump inhibitors for the treatment of G reflux disease. So, uh, there is uh, no role for other drugs like uh, coating agents or H2 receptor antagonists or prokinetics. Uh, the drugs of choice in the treatment of proton pump inhibitors is uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, GRD is uh, proton pump inhibitors uh, as prescribed by Indian Society of uh, Gastroenterology. The standard dose is for uh, four weeks as a first line therapy. It's used empirically. And in the erosive esophagitis, uh, we can extend it up to eight weeks. For recurrence of symptoms, again, we can give it for another uh, uh, four weeks uh, and so on. Long-term PPI should be offered as a maintenance therapy in severe erosive esophagitis like uh, grade C or grade D, uh, Los Angeles classification of uh, G reflux. Uh, we can use them for a longer period of time. If uh, a patient has got uh, severe heartburn in a severe reflux disease like grade C, grade D, we can double the dose of the PPI and use it for about eight weeks and so on. So FDA has approved uh, the uh, this uh, proton pump inhibitors uh, in the uh, dose of about 40 milligram when it comes to about pentaprazole. And uh, you can use it for 8 to 16 weeks. Indications of pentaprazole in GRD as a short term. Thank you. Uh, the dosage is 40 milligram. Duration is 8 weeks. Can be used in children in a smaller dosage. Whenever there is a GRD severity like A to D, B, C, all this, and the Duration is as long as 8 weeks in the dose of uh, 40 mg pentaprazole. I think I'll skip this uh, trials and studies. It's a bit uh, complicated. We, we may not follow it. Oral disintegrating tablet of pentaprazole for G reflux disease, especially in uh, when there is a dysphagia. If patient has got uh, difficulty in swallowing or if there is a suspected uh, peptic stricture, uh, a bigger tablet or capsule, suppose, uh, can't be swallowed, we can use a disintegrating tablet as it is shown. It's in the powder form or as soon as you swallow, it undergoes uh, disintegration. It will become a powder form, easy to swallow, and it will reach the stomach as well as uh, the microgranules can go up uh, down into the upper intestine. So that brings us to the uh, completion of uh, just uh, today's discussion. I think uh, we'll take up the questions uh, and answers session in that uh, we can have more extended uh, discussion. So uh, to summarize, 
G reflux disease is a very common problem with uh, prevalence being around 15 to 20 percent in the community. And uh, empirically, we can give PPIs initially to treat the classical reflux uh, symptoms. If there is uh, not much of a response or if you suspect atypical GRD, if you suspect uh, the alarming symptoms like dysphagia, GI bleed, anemia, then we should do an endoscopy to find out uh, 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 non-GRD conditions like uh, motility problems, eosinophilic esophagitis, malignancy, and so on. And in suspected patients, uh, when there is uh, diagnostic dilemma is there, we can uh, do a further evaluation with uh, uh, manometry and uh, pH metry. And uh, in uh, severe river, uh, erosive esophagitis patients, we can do the optimization of the dose of the proton pump inhibitors. Sometimes we can even add proton uh, prokinetic drugs besides lifestyle modifications. And if uh, the symptoms are still persisting, then there is a, what is called as uh, GRD, I mean uh, PPI dependent G reflux disease or refractory G reflux disease patients. Such patients, uh, we need to uh, think beyond drugs and consider endoscopic or laparoscopic methods of uh, uh, treating the, such patients. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for the comprehensive talk. The presentation was really very informative. Before we start our Q&A round, I would like to kindly request all of our participant doctors to take a moment to share your feedback through the survey located below your video screens. Those who are viewing in full screen needs to minimize to access the feedback survey. For those watching in full screen mode, please consider minimizing your screen momentarily to access the survey. So, sir, with all your permission, can I put the questions across? Yeah, sure. Okay, sir. So, the first question has been done by Madhusudan Parekh. For how long PPI can be taken safely in case of reflux uh, and has horizontal stomach with volvulus? Yeah, come again. The, the, I, I, I got the first half of the question. Uh, so horizontal the stomach and valvulus. I, I, I didn't get it. Can you repeat the question? Yes, yes, definitely. For how long PPI can be taken safely in case of reflux has horizontal stomach with volvulus? Yeah. Uh, let me ask, I mean, answer the uh, first part of the question. Uh, that is, uh, the uh, how long we have to, uh, I mean, we can safely take uh, proton pump inhibitors. Uh, PPIs can be taken for many months or years. There is a data, omeprazole data and uh, pentaprazole data, which wherein uh, the PPI is uh, taken beyond 12 years also. Not much of a problem. Of course, uh, with any uh, drug or every drug, uh, there are certain uh, side effects uh, which are mentioned, but the, they can be overcome if you are, uh, you know, careful and uh, watchful, not a big problem. Regarding that valvulus and uh, this one, it's a, altogether, I feel, a separate entity needs, uh, if it's a symptomatic, uh, uh, we need to do a surgical correction if it is uh, causing severe uh, uh, pain, abdomen, or vomiting. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Moving on to our next question, which has been put forward by Ashish Kumar. How long it is safe to use pantoprazole in RD patients? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, rheumatoid arthritis patients uh, uh, can have uh, GI symptoms as well. They can take it as long as it is required. But uh, we have to be uh, on the lookout for uh, the uh, side effects like uh, osteoporosis or certain uh, other uh, uh, problems like B12 deficiency. And uh, some of the PPIs are implicated in the, you know, uh, certain renal uh, diseases or uh, GI infections. These are some of the concerns uh, which are, uh, you know, uh, uh, shown by certain uh, in, uh, in the literature, but it's a very small percentage of patients uh, who can get into this kind of problems. But uh, generally, the PPIs are safe, but uh, we should uh, be judicious in their usage. If it's absolutely required only, we have to use. And if the G reflux disease, especially in rheumatoid arthritis, is not very severe, you can even uh, 
resort to using something like a H2 receptor antagonist. So our next question has been put forward by Shivdas Digambar Jagdale that whether it is okay to use PPI with etopride. Yeah, definitely there are lots of formulations uh, of PPI and prokinetic combination. PPIs, uh, pentaprazole is combined with etopride and uh, many uh, other PPIs are combined with uh, uh, domperidone and uh, uh, leosulfuride. But uh, uh, there is a, a small subset of, uh, mm, you know, uh, people say that uh, these are irrational combinations and uh, better not to use them. But in India, uh, uh, we get a lot of these PPI prokinetic combinations, especially with etopride, not much of a problem. And uh, they are uh, especially useful in uh, severe G reflux disease as well as diabetic gastroparesis. Thank you so much, sir. Our next question has been done by Dr. Rizwan Ahmad. What is the role of PPI in TB patients? Yeah, there's no role or there's no uh, indication for PPIs in tuberculosis patients at all. So our next question is has done by Bhushan Ji Balal, sir. Which PPI is recommended in children with GERD? Yeah, in children, you can use pantaprazole. You can use even, uh, you know, esomeprazole. Uh, pantaprazole is safe and uh, we can use uh, in a small dose like 20 milligram. And pediatricians traditionally have been using lansoprazole. So not much of a problem. Okay, sir. So our next question has been put forward by Dr. Mathisul Mahesh Mahadev that what is the PPI effect on renal function and how pantoprazole is superior to omeprazole being both belonging to PPI group? Yeah, uh, PPI and uh, the renal safety has uh, uh, been brought into a sharp focus uh, in the last few years. There is a small uh, uh, literature uh, data shows that long-term PPI can lead to AKI, that is acute kidney injury. And in small percentage of patients, uh, they have shown that uh, uh, they can develop uh, chronic kidney disease, that is CKD. But uh, I think uh, that literature is controversial. Um, but by and large, uh, the pentaprazole compared to omeprazole is safe and uh, you can give it in a needy patient, but uh, just because uh, PPI is there, its abuse is uh, uh, not justified. Okay, sir. So our next question has been put forward by Dr. Muhammad Jisan Ansari, sir. How long do a PPI work and can we give it multiple times a day, example BD? Yeah, we can uh, give it, uh, you know, usually given like once a day, but in a small percentage of patients like grade C, grade D reflux patients, uh, we do give uh, BD also. And in GI bleeds, uh, we can give it multiple times, uh, three times a day also, injectable um, medications. Pantoprazole is given three times a day. And even PPI is given as a continuous infusion whenever there is an ongoing GI bleed, like peptic ulcer bleed. So our next question is has been done by Dr. Madhulika Pritam Rao. How to differentiate between heart, burn or gastritis and any cardiac pain when only pain is in gastric region for a while? Heart, heart burn and, uh, uh, and gastric pain. Yeah. So these are all, uh, you know, uh, um, one uh, problem is uh, there is a little bit of a uh, variation in the terminology. GRD commonly presents with uh, retrosternal burning sensation or so what is so called as uh, heartburn in the lower part of the chest. There is uh, some kind of a warm sensation and it's uh, usually in the postprandial or after eating food. Uh, the so-called gastritis uh, or the stomach-related uh, pain 
the pain is in the upper part of the abdomen between the xiphoid sternum and the umbilicus. It can be a burning pain or it could be some kind of a, a, a bloating or the fullness that is present in the upper abdomen. So we, we also call it as uh, uh, postprandial distress syndrome or functional dyspepsia. GRD, you will get uh, the warm sensation or burning sensation in the lower part of the chest. Uh, usually that occurs uh, after eating food or after eating the spicy food. And uh, the one other thing I think you said is uh, the cardiac problem. Here, there will be atypical chest pain predominantly in the central part of the chest or in the left part of the chest uh, overlying the heart area, so-called precordial chest pain. So, the musculoskeletal problems and the cardiac chest pain sometimes uh, will be a uh, close differential diagnosis and uh, they will be more confusing uh, with uh, uh, G reflux disease uh, at times, not always. But we should uh, take a proper history and try to differentiate it and treat them uh, with appropriate therapy. Thank you so much, sir. Moving forward. Uh, the question has been put forward by Dr. Aisha Ayaz. Do we recommend PPIs in a young female with jerk or there are better alternatives? Yeah, there is no problem. Uh, we can definitely give PPIs uh, in a young female uh, with a G reflux disease. Uh, only thing we should be careful if it's a young female giving a co-administration uh, of uh, the prokinetics like domperidone or levosulfiride as it can cause galactoria or milk secretion from the breast. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, just a PPI therapy in a uh, GRD uh, in female patients, not a problem. So our next question is done by Dr. Pramod Patil. What are the limitations for prolonged use of PPI in cases of chronic type 2 and type 1 diabetes? Yeah, diabetes, in general, chronic uh, PPI therapy can lead to GI infections. And in uh, diabetes mellitus, uh, the GI infections can be uh, more worse. And... Uh, there will be gastroparesis, giving only PPIs again can cause uh, worsening of that problem. Uh, in general, in diabetic patients, uh, the PPI therapy is not very much required. We need to give them actually prokinetics in addition to PPI or prokinetics much more than the uh, proton pump inhibitors. <coughs> Thank you so much, sir. Our next question has been done by Dr. Shomo. Is the PPI usage in long run carcinogenic? Yeah, I mean, uh, in general, the PPI usage has been, uh, you know, uh, seen with uh, always suspicion. Uh, there is no suspicion of cancer or uh, the risk of cancer with a prolonged uh, PPI therapy, but uh, PPIs uh, are uh, known to cause uh, certain other side effects like uh, vitamin B12 deficiency, osteoporosis, calcium, magnesium deficiency, GI infections and uh, pneumonia, clostridium difficile and so on. Uh, the malignancy is not at all a concern with uh, chronic PPI therapy. There is a, a one thing uh, what uh, we have seen is uh, the uh, so-called fundic gland uh, hyperplasia, that kind of uh, polyps, benign polyps, uh, which are seen in, uh, 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 I mean, humans, what we have seen. But in uh, rats, people have shown that they can cause the carcinoids. So that's one of the problems. But uh, it's not like a full-blown cancer. These are all uh, uh, some sort of... Uh, histological types of mucosal changes, what we see. So our next question has been done by Dr. Ramarajesh Sekar. First of all, he has given a warm welcome to you, sir. 
and his question is that nowadays most of the patients took PPI for long periods and took tablets for DM or SHT or CAD. Is it advisable, sir? Yeah, in case uh, it's uh, indicated uh, like uh, there are associated cardiac problems or uh, uh, lung problem. Uh, if a patient has uh, proper indication like G reflux disease, GI bleed or peptic ulcer disease, we can advise uh, proton pump inhibitors, especially the pentaprazole uh, with uh, multiple co-prescriptions if they are there, like antiplatelets in chronic uh, coronary artery disease. Uh, we can uh, give uh, not a problem. Of course, uh, a few years back, uh, co-administration of uh, proton pump inhibitors with uh, antiplatelet drugs, uh, uh, people were... Uh, 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 you know, uh, skeptical about uh, the cardiovascular uh, events like coronary artery events and also the cerebrovascular events. Uh, now that uh, again uh, the concern of uh, drug interactions with uh, PPIs and antiplatelets is gone, uh, we can use them safely. Thank you so much, sir. Our next question has been done by Dr. Lalit Mahesh. Which is the most potent PPI in case of liver disease? Yeah, most of the PPIs are, uh, you know, metabolized by the liver, cytochrome P450 enzyme. So we need to be careful if there is a liver disease in usage of the, uh, you know, PPI usage. Uh, there's nothing like, uh, uh, you know, this drug is... Uh, uh, okay in a liver disease. Most of the PPIs have got equal risk of uh, the side effects and uh, we should be you, uh, you know careful in using this PPI. There's nothing like uh, this particular PPI is the best in liver disease. So our next question has been done by Dr. Sanjay Malhotra. How long proton pump inhibitor can be given to a patient without side effects? Uh, there are uh, studies which uh, show that it's given for many years, uh, like 12 to 15 years. And of course, uh, there are certain side effects, uh, as we discussed with uh, proton pump inhibitors. We should be watchful and careful. And if there is a requirement, uh, say, for example, there is a right indication, uh, we can use it. And in fact, uh, in the Indian Journal of Gastroenterology, we have brought out, uh, uh, you know, the... Um, a safety and the PPI stewardship program discussed by 20 eminent gastroenterologists across India. And it's a beautiful publication as a, which has come as a guideline. And uh, when to use a PPI, when not to use a PPI. PPI should not be used as a simple uh, co-prescription and it should not be abused. And just without proper indication, we shouldn't uh, be giving it. Thank you so much, sir. Our next question has been done by Dr. Anil Kumarji. Uh, his question is, is the G-reflex is related to excess ionic intake? Not really. Okay, sir. So, our uh, next question is from... Uh, so, we have already covered such questions. Now, we haven't received any such questions more, sir. Yeah. So, well, uh, thank you so much, sir, for answering all the queries of the doctors. And I would also like to thank all the participating doctors for your continuous participation at our platform. So, before we conclude, we want any last comments from your side. Yeah. Uh, I need to, uh, you know, just uh, uh, understand, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of uh, questions have come from uh, various doctors regarding the safety of the proton pump inhibitors. That's a very, uh, I mean, good point. It's a welcome point. Otherwise, uh, in the day-to-day -day practice, we see that PPIs are used as uh, uh, just co-prescription. Simply, uh, we see that uh, without proper indication, some PPIs are prescribed just like multivitamins. So, we have to take a necessary care, you know, uh, care and uh, use uh, 
uh, caution in using uh, this proton pump uh, inhibitors. They are generally safe, but uh, we shouldn't be just uh, giving them uh, without a proper indication. One of the commonest indications uh, we see in our practice is that G reflux disease, wherein uh, the PPIs are used for longer time, uh, longer than a few weeks or months. Otherwise, uh, uh, the PPI usage uh, for a long time is not there, but using them as, uh, you know, suppose somebody is giving an antibiotic, the PPI is given as a co-prescription. Suppose patient is getting discharged, PPI is given as uh, just one uh, common prescription at the while patient is going home, uh, getting discharged from the hospital. Or patient is just taking some other drug just to avoid gastritis, PPIs are given. That kind of practice should be avoided and we should be careful in choosing these drugs and prescribing. So please, I request at some time to take your time out and read the, you know, the guidelines and the recommendations which you have brought out and which is published in Indian Journal of Gastroenterology, the PPI stewardship program for the common uh, practitioners. So with that, I think uh, we will come to the end of today's uh, session. Uh, that is discussion on proton pump inhibitors uh, in the uh, treatment of G reflux disease. I once uh, thank you. Before, before we yeah. conclude, sir, we have yeah. received some more questions, sir. Sorry, but we have received some questions for you. Uh, so the question has been put forward by Dr. Rakshit Kapoor. How long can we use PPI in a DM type 2 patient safely? Yeah, I think this question has been asked. I think I'll uh, reiterate uh, my answer that uh, in diabetic patients, uh, most of the times we need to give them prokinetics rather than the PPI. But if there is a right indication, as long as it is required, if there is a reflux disease associated with that diabetes mellitus, we can use PPI for uh, at least, uh, uh, you know, uh, eight weeks time and beyond that uh, it should be guided by the symptoms okay sir so our next question is has been done by dr surya prakash that whether ppi cause, causes hyperprolactinemia no uh, ppi does not result in hyperprolactinemia presents addition of uh, uh, you know prokinetics like domperidone and pro uh, Leosulfide causes hyperprolactinemia. I think uh, there is a uh, recent uh, newspaper publication that uh, esomeprazole drug uh, pharmacovigilance analysis somewhere uh, has shown that uh, it has caused hyperprolactinemia, that is uh, excess uh, milk secretion from the breast. Uh, so, but it's not the usual. Uh, a scenario what we see maybe i think it's one of those rare uh, finding that it must have come uh, we shouldn't be worried about the hyperprolactinemia with the ppis alone so our next question has been put forward by dr prakash manur sir do the long term use of ppi like more than 15 days produce gynecomastia no that's what uh, no gynecomastia by ppi So, next question has been done by Dr. Ravina Shrikant Gosavi that whether the long PPI use causes disturbance in gut flora. Yeah, definitely that is yes. It can cause disturbance in the gut flora. There will be small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. There will be Clostridium difficile infections and many bacterial infections uh, can occur uh, in long-term PPI because... Uh, PPI suppress the acid. Acid actually acts as a first level of protection uh, when we eat food. Any microorganism that goes through the stomach will be destroyed. When we use PPI, it will suppress the acid that is present in the stomach. So the first level of defense is uh, altered. Uh, so as a result of that, these patients are more prone for gut infections. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for answering all the last minute questions uh, because we were almost in the conclusion mode. Uh, I guess you have covered the lecture very informed. One was 
providing information very nicely. So, sir, with uh, all your permission, are we good to conclude the session over here? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Okay. Have a nice day and have a nice day to all participants, doctor as well. Yeah, thank you once again.